Hello, amazing listeners. I'm here at KubeCon Cloud NativeCon 2023 in Chicago. This is a special edition of Day 2 Cloud we're calling Cube Conversations. Over the course of the conference, I got to speak to vendors and open source maintainers about what's going on in the cloud native ecosystem. From those conversations, I picked up on a few major themes, specifically platform engineering and security. This is part one of a two-part episode focused on security in a cloud-native world. We'll first start with my conversation with Anis Erlich, a developer advocate from Aqua, all about the recently announced Kubernetes Bill of Materials. Joining me now for the Day 2 Cloud Cube Conversations is Anais Ulrich, open source developer advocate at Aqua, to talk about Kubernetes security challenges and some fresh news that Aqua has released during the conference. So... Welcome to the show, Anais. Thank you so much for joining. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what Aqua does? Thank you for having me. So I'm the open source developer advocate at Aqua Security, meaning I'm only working with our open source projects, which are Aqua Trivi, which is an all-in-one cloud-native security scanner, and Tracy, an eBPF-based security and forensic tool. Okay. Now, those are the two open source projects at Aqua, or two main projects. Under the hood, there are several smaller projects that somehow integrate with them. But then separately, we have the enterprise platform. Now, the enterprise platform is separate from the open source project. There's no direct onboarding curve from open source to enterprise. It's just that Aqua Security uses our open source projects under the hood for their CNAP platform. CNAP stands for Cloud Native Security Platform. Uh, And they're using Trivi, for example, as well as Tracy, similar to how other projects use CNCF open source tools. So similar to how there are lots of projects that build and integrate with Agro CD, Aqua Security is using Trivi and Tracy for their security platform. Gotcha. Trivi and Tracy. Those are fun (laughs) names. I like them. One of the big themes of the conference has been security. When I look at the floor, there are so many security-related vendors and projects out there, all trying to address unique challenges. Yeah. What in your mind is the biggest or one of the biggest challenges to cloud-native security today? So I'm going to break down your question into two parts. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> First of what has been the trends in the security space here at KubeCon? So there are lots of projects, like you mentioned, and it's really difficult, even when you're working in a space, to keep an overview of like what's going on, who's working on what, right. what are the innovations. I mean, one of the themes is that more and more projects are providing an all-in-one offering in that they are not just telling you what issues you might have in your stack, in Mm -hmm. your running workloads in your Kubernetes cluster, but they also try to make it more and more context-specific to your environment. So that's one theme, and different projects take different approaches on how they do it. Some of them do it with eBPF analyzing. Some of them do it even with AI projects, Mm. AI-related projects. So what we have actually released at KubeCon is KBOM, and I think we're going to get to that. KBOM. (laughs) KBOM. So for instance, last year, the past two years, I would say even, a big theme has been Mm SBOM, and that stands for Software Bill of Material. Now, we want to provide with our open source tools, with our open source security scanner, Trivi, all-in-one security scanning. And we've moved it to cloud infrastructure scanning throughout the past years. So we started off with AWS service scanning. And now we are making more and more Kubernetes specific and providing KBOM uh, generation and scanning. But that has been a big theme for us. <laughs> when you're scanning, are you scanning the code that generates the infrastructure? Or are you actually scanning the infrastructure as it's running at the moment? So Trivi can do both. Okay. It can scan the code that's going to run on your infrastructure. It can scan your infrastructure from your cloud providers. And it can now scan also the running Kubernetes cluster, the running Kubernetes infrastructure. And with that, it basically scans all of the core Kubernetes components that come as part of your control plane, as part of your worker nodes Mm -hmm. to run your Kubernetes cluster to show you what's inside, what are the security issues of that cluster that you might encounter or if you're using all the versions of Kubernetes, all the flavors of Kubernetes distributions, then it will tell you what issues you have in your cluster. 
Okay. So just like the software build materials that's meant to look at, hey, your project is actually made up of these 50 other open source libraries and tracing back the versions of those yeah. so you can flag, okay, I see this line item in my build materials. Yeah. That has a vulnerability. We have to update yeah. that line item. This is yeah. taking a similar approach to a Kubernetes cluster. So exactly. So with software builds of material, you basically generate, for example, an SBOM of your container images. It tells you all of the libraries, dependencies that are in that container image. Mm -hmm. And then you can scan that SBOM for vulnerabilities. Okay. Now, we have taken the same approach on Kubernetes cluster, and that's our Kubernetes bill of material. It's not the workloads that you install on your cluster, but it's basically looking at what is the cluster composed of? What makes the Kubernetes version the components run? What is running your workloads? And it's providing this inventory list of all the libraries that are used within, whether that's your add-ons or the Kubernetes components. Right. And then you have either that KBOM, that inventory list, that you can scan for vulnerabilities, for security issues, or you can scan your cluster directly with, with Trivi for security issues. Interesting. Okay. I was going to ask you about like operators and other things that you would include in the cluster. That's not your application necessarily. It's the things that help that application. So you can include those in your bill of materials. So it, it really depends. There's a, there's a fine line between add-ons that <laughs> let's such as Celium that you would run for your networking layer. Sure. Um, that's, that would be an add-on that's part of your core infrastructure. That that's something we would, we would mm -hmm. include in a KBOM. Uh, if you're using a GitOps operator, that's your application choice. We okay. include that as an S bomb of the running workloads within. Ah, okay. So you have to draw that delineation yeah. behind uh, between what's part of the cluster itself and what are the workloads running on it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And if I want to update the K bomb with the latest uh, based off of what's in my cluster, then I could use Trivi to generate an updated K bomb and then scan that. Yes. So you would use. Trivi, you would use the CLI to do ad hoc um, KBOM generation and scanning either through the KBOM or directly off the cluster. Now, you mentioned operators. I have actually was asked yesterday if that's also something people can automate, but that's an aspect you wouldn't necessarily want to automate because you're not changing your Kubernetes cluster core components on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, such as your workloads that you might deploy or change on an hourly basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So thinking through that a little bit more in terms of deploying new clusters... Yeah. Can I use uh, the KBOM to validate a newly deployed cluster and say it matches up to an approved KBOM? You can use the KBOM to scan a new cluster, to scan right now any upstream Kubernetes cluster, any, any Kubernetes cluster that's based on the upstream Kubernetes project, as well as several different flavors of Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Now we going to work on making more and more specific to different cloud providers as cloud providers add their own tooling on top of their Kubernetes classes that they provide in their managed versions. But basically any new cluster you can scan, you can generate a KBOM off and you can scan it for vulnerabilities to see, okay, what vulnerabilities does it come with? Um, but it's going to be especially useful if you are maybe using new versions, if you're deploying your own Kubernetes cluster on metal servers and then running your own version of Kubernetes, uh, as well as if you're using older uh, versions of Kubernetes you might have, or like you haven't updated your Kubernetes cluster for some time. Yeah, yeah I know. So, some of the cloud hyperscalers force you to yeah. upgrade your cluster, your managed yeah. clusters at yeah. certain points. So like AKS, I think you can only be so many minor versions behind yeah. before they bump you. Yeah, you shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> it might give people the additional kick to have that information, right? Right, yeah. right. So this is more generally focused on people who are self-hosting their cluster, whether they're building it on you know, cloud VMs or bare metal in their um, data center? Yeah. yeah. So for now it is, but as I mentioned, we are going to make it more and more cloud specific. The initial work that we've done up to this KubeCon was really to take the Kubernetes vulnerability database uh, and convert that into a usable version. So okay. right now, as it was provided by Kubernetes, by the core maintainers, by the project itself, uh, you couldn't directly filter it into a security scanner the way that we use, for mm. example, advisories from other providers, from okay. other vendors, such as Red Hat, Canonical, when they release their vulnerabilities for specific versions that they provide, uh, it's easy easier to filter directly in a security scanner to include mm -hmm. it directly in the Trivi vulnerability database. Now we had to do an additional step 
to change the vulnerability database from Kubernetes to make it usable within Trivi. And there are additional plans and conversations around how we are going to contribute it back to Kubernetes uh, right. with the Kubernetes maintainers to make it also more usable for other projects. But basically, that was the initial work, the initial step to create KBOMs for Kubernetes upstream, as well as some specific versions such as microcades, kind Kubernetes clusters. And now it's going to be made uh, more and more Kubernetes cloud provider specific. Yeah. Interesting. And I'm going to throw a little curveball here because yeah. another trend that I've been hearing a lot about is the expansion to the edge and the idea of running Kubernetes at the edge. So does yeah. this also have an application for I'm running a fleet of Kubernetes clusters in my edge locations and I just want to validate all of those with the K-bomb? You could. It can easier provide you an overview of how do the different Kubernetes installation might differ, like if you spin okay. them up over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally, if you have a fleet of edge Kubernetes clusters, they have to be interoperable, right? To communicate, run the same <laughs> workloads, right? You wouldn't would want to make so, the yeah. workload specific. So I would assume they are highly similar, but you could verify that not one of them has a the vulnerabilities that the others don't have, for example. Yeah, okay. That might be a use case. But yeah, you could use it for that. Yeah. Uh, in terms of Kubernetes distributions, do you support, like, I think you mentioned microcates is something you're looking at, kind. I know there's also K3S. So are all of those going to be supported or currently supported? They are currently supported. So in general, for every Kubernetes cluster, it will provide you information. It will provide you with the libraries, additional information that are used within a Kubernetes cluster. It's just not as useful for your specific Google Cloud managed Kubernetes cluster as it could be. Okay. So you can use it independent of which provider you're using for your managed cluster, it's just not um, as relevant for you as it as we want it to be in the future, basically. Okay. And you said this is included with Trivi. So this is part of the open source project. If I wanted to produce a K-bomb, I wouldn't have to pay Aqua anything. We don't know. I'm always saying that with Trivi, we don't know as... You as a user that you exist, we don't know that you're using <laughs> Trivi. We don't know how many scans or what type of scans you run. You could be doing whatever you want with Trivi. You could use it in your own projects. You can use it ad hoc. You can use it on a continuous basis. You can run thousands of scans how many you like. It's You right. don't know you exist. <laughs> if I wanted to implement this, what sort of workflow would you see Trivi and the K-Bomb being part of? Because you mentioned mm -hmm. like daily scans or mm -hmm. part of my pipeline. How would you see this integrating into someone's general operations workflow? Generally, people use the Trivi CLI either ad hoc on their developer machines, either through extensions such as VS Code, other integrations in other tools that they are using, for example, Docker Desktop as an extension there, or they integrate Trivi as like the container image for continuous scans in their CICD platform. Okay. So those are like the two main use cases for the Trivi CLI and you can run all sorts of scans really ad hoc or in an automated way. Now separately we have the Trivi operator and the Trivi operator is a Kubernetes native operator that lives in your Kubernetes cluster and whenever there's a new workload or a change to your cluster it or six hours have passed it will redo a scan of your workloads to tell you what's wrong with those workloads. So this is different to the KBOM in that, for example, if it produces a vulnerability report, the Trivi operator is focused on the workloads that you have installed that make up your application stack. Okay. And that's done on a continuous basis. And people then basically send those reports, whether those are compliance, misconfiguration, vulnerability reports, they send it to an external platform and process it there. So okay. Trivi is really there to generate the reports for you. And it's up to you what you want to do with those reports and how mm -hmm. you want to visualize them or, or make use or store them long term. Now, the way that we envision the use of KBOM is when you, as, as you mentioned, when you start and you, when you spin up a new cluster to scan that cluster for security issues to make sure that you have over time um, a inventory list of what's actually included in a cluster. Did anything change when you upgrade the cluster? Um, different versions. And then uh, you can store those changes long term, depending on which company you work for, you might want to do that. <laughs> right. Otherwise, it's also just making sure that, uh, for example, your security team, your platform engineering team knows what do developers actually use locally. How could you improve that from a security perspective as well? You know, the KBOM scan is really meant to be ad hoc for now. So the day-to-day -day engineer wouldn't necessarily use the KBOM scan. They would rely on a Kubernetes distribution to be provided to them or being told of like, hey, use this type of cluster. Gotcha. Okay. 
Uh, last question. Mm-hmm. If folks do want to take this for a test drive, yeah. where can they go to learn more or actually try the K-Bomb out for themselves? Yeah, totally. Uh, so we have a Trivi website, trivi.dev, where you okay. can then find the GitHub repository. Also, we are close to 20,000 stars on GitHub, so make <laughs> sure to give us a start. We want to reach that milestone soon. So <laughs> uh, awesome. really excited for that. <laughs> Big party. But um, yeah, so generally uh, the Acrosec um, GitHub repository, uh, GitHub organizations where we have all of our projects, uh, where you can find the Tracy repository, the Trivi repository, and related projects. And um, then it's similar to how you use any other open source project. You check out the GitHub, you check out the documentation, join our Slack community, and give us feedback and ask questions there. Awesome. Well, nice. <laughs> thank you so much for being a guest today on Day 2 awesome. Cloud. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Next up, I had the pleasure to chat with Michael Cade, the global field CTO at Veeam Software, all about the cool stuff they're doing in Kasten to protect Kubernetes applications from ransomware. Joining me now on the Day 2 Cloud Cube Conversations is Michael Cade. He's the global field CTO at Veeam slash Kasten, and he is here to talk about cloud native security from an interesting angle, especially around ransomware and some fresh news they've released during the conference. So welcome, Michael. Can you first give the audience a little background on Kasten and how it fits into the world of Veeam? Hey, Ned. Yeah, happy to be here. So Kasten is um, Kubernetes backup is really the easy way to put it to everyone. Okay. Is, <laughs> is like focused on protecting workloads, data services within Kubernetes. So think about your databases, your data services, Postgres, blah, blah, blah. But also think about data services that are associated to that Kubernetes application, think about AWS RDS, think about MongoDB Atlas. So it's not just about the data service within. So how that relates then to Veeam is Veeam, for those that are not familiar with Veeam, is very much started about protecting virtual machine workloads. And then we've extended that out to SaaS and PaaS-based workloads, cloud workloads, etc. So we're kind of meeting in the middle there from a Cloud native, cloud, virtual, and all of the platforms where we seem to have out there in the world, right? Whether you're an enterprise customer or the smallest of SMBs. Right, that's an interesting point you made that it's not just Kubernetes that has your data. There are other things that interact with it. And that was actually when I was doing a survey of the existing Kubernetes data protection things that were out there, say, two or three years ago. That was the big flaw was none of them were unified. Everyone was very piecemeal in the the sense that, okay, this one will do your persistent volumes, but it might not back up anything else, your manifests yeah. or uh, your config maps. And then this one will do everything in Kubernetes, but it won't do RDS or SQL or wherever else your application exists. And I was like, come on, people, we know that applications don't run entirely in Kubernetes. Exactly. I'm still yet to speak to a customer where they just have Kubernetes clusters. <laughs> right. like they don't have any EC2, they don't have any virtual machines, they don't have any physical. Like, What a world that would be if you just had that. I think the other thing to add on there is around application consistency consistency, right, is how you can't just take a grab at a database. It's a transactional workload that is constantly being hit if it's a busy database. And for you to just go, right, I just want a copy of that, there's no consistency to that. So I think that's another area is you're absolutely right, is we're either just backing up a small element of that data service, or it's all just in Kubernetes, or it's out. I think we have to consider that consistency as well to that application. Yeah, and lining up that consistency across multiple components, that's quite a challenge. Very much so. Like, if you think about Veeam's background, is it was a lot easier when you just had a database VM. Right. And all of your databases <laughs> were in it, and we could use VSS, and we could use pre- and post-all scripts. Lovely job. And maybe you had a cluster of databases, and we made that easy. Then when you start getting into the microservice world, maybe we've got a different database for a different part of your microservice. Maybe we're using Postgres for user authentication. Maybe we're using a catalog in MongoDB. And you've got all of these micro database services. I don't know if that's a a coin term, but I'm going to coin (laughs) it it here here now. (laughs) Um, So we've got different databases for the right jobs, whereas before we probably spent a lot of money on a certain database, maybe that begins with O, and we just had to make do. We put all of our databases and all of our data services into that, and we just protect that. So in the Kubernetes or cloud native world, we've got a little bit more choice, freedom of choice, overwhelming choice, whichever side you want to lay on. But yeah, we've got that capability of being able to choose the right database for the right job. Right, right, and the right tool to back it up. Now, the theme of this episode of Cube Conversations is cloud-native security, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on what you think are the biggest challenges or the main challenge behind 
proper cloud native security today? So I think the first and foremost is where we started from a, a data security point of view was the ransomware scare that we've seen across any platform, right? Whether it's virtualization and being able to send our backups to an immutable object storage location. Right. And I think that's a de facto. But again, if you look at the other backup vendors that are here, they're way behind when it comes to where we're storing that data in that secure manner. So we did that a few releases ago. Maybe it was Detroit last year, but we're going back quite a way. What we also have done over the last year or so is looking at preventative tasks, like understanding what is not normal, what is an anomaly when it comes to people accessing that data, restoring that data. If a bad person gets into your environment, regardless of what environment that is, it's known within the industry that people are going after the backup files. They're going after sure. that. So we have to make one, make that immutable, but also I want to raise a, an alarm. I want to raise a flag to say, wait, someone's doing something that they shouldn't be doing. So we brought in observability to be able to see that trend or at least the anomaly of that so that we we're making the backup admin, the data, whoever's responsible for the data, aware of someone's trying to tamper with stuff. So we brought that in. And then more recently with our release this week at KubeCon, it's about, okay, we know what our swim lane is and it's generally around data management. We could start with backup, but it's more around resilience, generally the last line of defense. There's a lot of good companies out there that have done a lot around observability. We're not going to be an observability company, so let's right. dive in and integrate with the best guys on the show floor like Datadog and give that seam type in integration so that they can also allow to raise those red flags. Something bad's happening here, okay, what does that mean? Like, and if this, then that. If something bad happens, then let's trigger a backup policy or a restore policy into AWS EKS, or what do you want to happen? So there's an integration into seam products or observability to be able to define what happens if something bad looks to be happening. Maybe we can kick off that restore process before we even know that it is really bad. And then if it doesn't turn out to be bad, well, at least we started the engine early to get out of the house. Restores from backups are not immediate. They're not magic things that happen in milliseconds, especially for a large data set. That takes a little while to get it up to speed. So, you know, maybe we're getting the cruise ship out of the dock a little earlier. That yeah, we're good. just starting up all the engines like, on the plane, <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> right, right. I've always thought that uh, backup and data protection software in particular is in a unique position because it's constantly monitoring the status of the data it wants to protect. It's constantly checking in, and it has access to the historical changes that have been made to that data. So it puts it in a unique position to detect not only a ransomware threat, but just like malicious behavior in general. Is that part of what you're trying to address? Yeah, exactly that. And if, if we look at the bigger Veeam picture and what we're doing over on the virtualization world around using Yara, um, type rules and scanning engines. Again, we're not going to create our own new way of being able to understand malicious activity or sensitive data or PII, like personal identifiable information. Sure. We're going to leverage a model that's already out there and, and use that extensible model that we have within the Veeam data platform, including Cast and K10 for Kubernetes, to understand what that data is. And something that we spoke about like five years ago at Veeam was about leveraging data. I think you might have been on a cloud field day where I spoke about it. Leveraging that data, putting that data to work as well. And that could be just verifying the recoverability of that data. Right. Before you have to do it. Like I don't, I don't want to have to start the car. No, hang on. What's the, analogy? <laughs> What's the right analogy here? Because I don't want to only have to find out that my car's not working when I go to work in the morning. I want to make sure that it's definitely going to run. So we want to run a test beforehand to ensure that the data is, is a good copy of that data. And that, that includes the whole application to that. Right, it reminds me of when I got started with disaster recovery. And the disaster recovery test was kind of important because you didn't want to realize your disaster recovery process was bad during a disaster. Exactly that. And unfortunately, that actually happens to a lot of people. <laughs> I've been at Veeam for eight and a half years, like, so just talking about disaster recovery, bad things. I'm basically an insurance technologist where we talk about bad things happening. And that disaster, like from your experience, that DR testing and failover would have been extremely manual and a, an absolute pain. And no one was excited about testing it, but you kind of probably had to for, for audit reasons. 
I would say it was more for audit reasons than peace of mind that something was going to happen. You wanted to make sure. Yeah. Whereas now we've got the ability to automate this stuff and make sure that things are running and just get that report to say, oh, yeah, in a traditional Veeam manner, like the VM, the app and the OS, they're all good. Like, great. That backup is great. It's got a green tick. When we come to recover it, everything's going to be good. Same can be said to, to like the Kubernetes application. Granted, it's going to be it's made up of a lot more moving parts, a lot more artifacts. But if we could just spin that up in an isolated environment, test what you wanted to test to make sure everything was working, and then just give you a green tick to say that's good. And so these are part of what we're trying to bring into the the Kasten ecosystem as well. Right. Most of the security conversations I've had so far centered around protecting the application from attackers. And that's certainly an important part of it. But I think, and also uh, an equally important part is, if something does happen, what are you actually trying to protect? And it's probably going to be your data. Yeah. So uh, if you just reiterate, what was the announcement that Kasten had uh, during KubeCon for the enhancements in your product line? Yeah, so it was that, first of all, it was that seam integration with Datadog, but right. really exposing an extensibility or extensible API that any seam integration can happen. We just chose to partner with Datadog, probably got one of the biggest booths here, so it was the <laughs> right choice. Yeah. Um, but then also about like being able to get into the Kubernetes audit log and take advantage of that. We know what is suspicious in there. If, something bad, like if someone's trying to delete one of our custom resources, our restore points, then let's flag that up. And, and just being able to use that natively within Kubernetes is important. We can flash that up in our UI as part of the API and all of that good stuff. So I think that, that was probably one of the biggest, more general announcements that we made around security. I think the other thing is around Iron Bank, which is a secure container registry for the Department of Defense, for example. Oh, they use okay. a container registry that is vetted, a bit like a sort of FIPS type acronym that is basically a secure supply chain. Now, our supply chain, we already go through that model, which is why we were able to be adopted into that Iron Bank um, framework. But it just ensures that what we're writing is secure, rootless, and all of that good stuff you'd hopefully expect to see <laughs> from the show floor and all the applications that we have here. And so that were the two real key factors from a security standpoint, at least from a, a K10 6.5 release. Gotcha. Well, I mean, ultimately, it's about defense in depth. And yeah covering all the bases, so you can try to prevent the attackers from getting in, but if they do get in, protecting the data once they've tried to lock it up with ransomware or something like that. If folks are interested in learning more about Kasten, where's the best place to go to learn more information? So, Kasten.io or Veeam.com, there's a transition happening at the moment about a complete platform of being able to protect different environments under one roof. So I think it makes sense for that to be under the Veeam.com, but for now, in that transition, Kasten.io or Veeam.com are going to give you that. You're going to find enough out. If you want to particularly get down into the weeds around Kasten, K10, docs.kasten.io. That's not going away. That's our <laughs> bread and butter. Very proud of uh, like how that is written. And the getting started is super easy to get hands on. Well, I'm a big docs person. There so, yes, that's excellent. Good advice for everyone. Well, Michael, thank you so much for being a guest today on Day 2 Cloud. And enjoy the rest of the conference. Awesome. Cheers, Ned. Moving away from the world of data protection, my next guest is Ratan Tipineri from Tigera. I stole him away from his booth so we could briefly talk about catching threats at the network layer with eBPF. Joining me now on the Day 2 Cloud Cube Conversations is Ratan Tipernini. He's the president and CEO of Tigera, and he's here to talk about cloud native security and what Tigera is doing to enhance that security. So, Ratan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to join us. Can you first give the audience a little background on what Tigera is? Because they're probably familiar with their products, but they might not know the company behind it. Yeah, no, thanks, Dad, Ned. Very excited to be here. So we are the makers of Project Calico. It's the most widely adopted networking and security solution for containers on the planet. Uh, Tigera, we're in the business of preventing, de detecting, and mitigating breaches in cloud native applications. Okay, interesting. And so you mentioned security and cloud native applications. What do you see as being the biggest challenge in cloud native security today? You know, first is I think it's an unbounded problem. And the second is 
for the first time in the history of IT, we're seeing the notion of dynamic workloads. Mm. And most of the security solutions have been designed and architected in the past to optimize for static workloads. So there's a fundamental disconnect in what we're seeing, and you almost have to build something from the ground up to be able to secure these modern cloud workloads. That's the, the second time I've heard that word dynamic in the interviews I've been doing is this comparison to the static workloads we previously had, which then lined up with static security products. Now the workloads are more dynamic and the static security products haven't caught up. Is that what you're trying to address? That's the crux of it. It's uh, not about extending the existing solutions like firewalls, okay. which have done a pretty amazing job over the last 20, 30 years. Right. But you almost had to go back to the drawing board and start with a brand new design and use modern technologies like eBPF to be able to surface data and to be able to manage and secure these workloads, and that's what we've built. That's interesting, because when I think about solving the dynamic security problem initially, you had things like distributed firewalls that were like, yeah, we're going to do the firewall, we're just going to break it up into little pieces and give you a control plane to manage it. But what you're saying is that's not necessarily the correct approach, or maybe it's a yes and approach? Yeah, no, you're right about it. There was an evolution of firewalls where they tore it down and built it on a distributed architecture. But that's still a broken architecture. What you have to do to secure workloads is to actually, metaphorically speaking, put a firewall around each workload. The workload is the endpoint. And another way of saying it is, imagine if every workload in your cluster was exposed directly to the Internet. Would you be secure? So that's a good way to think about this. <laughs> that's a scary way to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly what's happening because you have no idea what's inside your cluster. Right. So you almost have to design a security policy with the assumption that your cluster's been breached and all workloads are exposed to the internet. Okay, and you mentioned eBPF, which I have a hard time saying quickly, <laughs> but I'm doing my best. How does that fit into sort of Tigera and the solution that you're building to address this dynamic workload problem? Yeah, eBPF is just a very powerful technology at the Unix kernel level. It allows you to surface data from the Unix kernel. And what we do is we built a set of very powerful probes to be able to surface data from the Unix kernel at the system call level, the file system level, the process level, and we have laid on some very powerful probes that then take all this data, digest it, and give you indicators of attack or indicators of compromise. And to step back and to up-level a little bit, one of the big gnarly problems in security is that there's a set of known threats, and you could argue that, relatively speaking, that's the easier problem to solve. Sure. And we have solved that. But the hard problem to solve is there are a set of unknown threats. So by definition, you don't know what those are. And the only way you get to the bottom of those threads is by looking for footprints of you know, bad actors who are doing suspicious things. And you almost have to look at the kernel level activity and surface it in a manner that helps you detect this and make sense of the data because there's a huge amount of data. So we've actually demystified all that stuff and built a plug-and-play solution where a user doesn't have to worry about messing it on with a kernel. We have simplified. All they have to do is to flip a switch, turn it on, and we protect all the workloads. What you're describing is something that's much more powerful than what a firewall would typically do, which is just looking at source and destination, looking at ports and protocols, and going, do I allow this or not? And then you've got like layer seven type analysis that's maybe looking inside the request and the response to do some additional digging. But it sounds like this eBPF thing has much more information it can draw on to build out a model of an interaction that's actually happening. No, you're spot on, you know. It, it, it allows you to surface data that wasn't visible or available before. But surfacing the data is only one part of it. You've got sure. to make sense of it and make it easy for the operators to actually use it and make it actionable so that you don't flood them with alerts. So that's the hard part. But your, your statement about the firewalls is absolutely spot on. If I were to describe the new generation of security tools, I'd probably categorize those into four buckets or functions that they have to perform. The first one is you have to start with the posture management of the workload itself. 
because it's our belief that it doesn't matter what you do downstream. If you don't have a really good security posture, uh, anything else you do is a lower a bit. And specifically, when I talk about posture, it comes down to micro-segmentation and separating uh, workloads at the namespace level or at the tenant level and ensuring that egress traffic is actually managed, which is actually a much harder problem with dynamic workloads. So those are the two basic things, and the vulnerability management is key to that with an idea of the score or the security score or the risk score associated with each vulnerability that you find in your system. So that's the first bucket, the security posture management. The second bucket is about how do you handle a set of known threats? Mm -hmm. For instance, maybe you have traffic to bad actors, bad IPs, bad domain names. How do you deal with that? How do you prevent that? And the third bucket really is how do you deal with a set of unknown threats? How do you actually secure your cluster workloads against that? And the fourth one is you will find something. You will find some threats. What do you do about it at that point? Can you quarantine workloads in real time before a remediation arrives? So the roughly those are the four buckets that any good security solution has for modern workloads. That makes a lot of sense to me. It's that first I need to actually have the information, then I need to analyze it, and then I need to decide what to do about it. How do I remediate the issue? And those are all unique challenges, and to have one solution do all three or four of those buckets, that's challenging. It is extremely challenging, and actually to lay it on a challenge on top of what you said, what we have discovered in dealing with customers is that the big single biggest problem in the industry right now is the gap in skilled resources mm. where customers are actually struggling to find operators who can actually manage and maintain these systems. And even if they're able to hire them, there's a high degree of turnover among them. So we went back to the drawing board and said, while all the stuff is great stuff that we have built from a technology, we said the only way to create sustainable value for our customers is to make everything plug and play. Extremely simple, extremely easy to use so that there isn't a dependence that you have a rocket scientist on the other end who's trying to figure out, figure all this out. So that has actually been a much harder problem to solve for us to make it extremely easy to solve. And some of the things are described, for instance, I'll give you the micro-segmentation where we separate namespaces inside a cluster. All you have, we do that automatically. We watch the traffic, configure the security policies, allow you to actually test it. You press a button, you push those policies into production. So that's an example of you know, plug and play or protecting against unknown threats. You point to a workload click once, Mm -hmm. and that's it. It's done. It's secured against unknown threats, right? Right. So that's the level of simplicity you have to deliver to actually create sustainable value for customers. That's a tough balance of simplicity and effectiveness, and it's a hard tightrope to walk. Well, this has really piqued my interest. Uh, Ratan, If people want to know more about your solution, what's a good place they could go to check out and get more information? So we have some amazing content on our website, tigera.io. That would be a good starting point. We have put a lot of emphasis on training. So there's a lot of material for someone who just wants to start down this path to educate themselves, to train themselves. We run workshops every week, and we have online tutorials. So that's a good place to start, tigera.io. Awesome. Ratan, well, thank you so much for being a guest on Day 2 Cloud, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. And while we're on the topic of protecting the network, my last guest for this part of the episode is Gene Fay, the CEO of ThreadX. He walked me through how ThreadX helps to protect the front end of web applications and their APIs. Joining me now for the Day 2 Cloud Cube conversations is Gene Fay, CEO of ThreadX, to talk about Cloud Native Security and some fresh news they've released during the conference. Gene, welcome to the show. Can you first give the audience a little background on ThreadX? Sure, absolutely. Well, first, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the podcast. I appreciate it. Uh, ThreadX is focused on API and application security. Uh, We've been at it a little while, focused on traditional cybersecurity problems, dealing with CISOs, helping them to solve traditional application and API problems. And now we've focused even more on the developer side of things, 
uh, helping more succinctly solve kind of the Kubernetes cybersecurity problem, specifically uh, leveraging some technology, uh, eBPF, which many of your listeners will be very familiar with. <laughs> it's come up a few times. Yeah. Exactly. That's interesting. And I want to dive into that particular aspect in a yeah. moment because yeah. when it's come up before, it has been more on the OPSEC side of things. Yeah as opposed to AppSec, which is where you're talking about. So I do want to pick that apart a little bit. But first, big picture, what do you see as the major security challenges facing the cloud native community today? Yeah, I think for us being relatively new to this side of the house, I think it's interesting for us to learn from our customers the problems they're dealing with. And Mm -hmm. I'll date myself. I've I've worked at companies like EMC, uh, selling traditional hardware, and I'm used to data centers and the cloud (laughs) thing. I've definitely evolved and I get the, the cloud thing. But I think as you look specifically into the container environment, it's so dynamic. Mm -hmm. And this whole idea that you could have a server come up, come down, or a container come up and go down in seconds, you know, 15 seconds, 30 minutes, whatever. And it's this constant evolving infrastructure that our cyber friends are kind of looking at going, how do we manage that? Right. Like, okay, we went from hardware to the cloud, but now you've got this whole environment that's so dynamic. Mm -hmm. And how do we protect each one of our, our containers, each one of our applications, each one of our APIs? So it's just a new problem. Problem set, and our, our customers are looking to us to go like, how, how do we solve that? So we're excited about that because we have ways to do that. But equally, it's it pretty daunting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a, a buzzword. I won't say a buzzword, but a common phrase that keeps coming up is dynamic. Yeah, and thinking about the traditional way of deploying applications, and you know, I I came up through the virtualization era where we moved to the idea of okay, this physical server is now going to have multiple lifetimes. Right as all these virtual machines and then containers further accelerated that and the cloud accelerated it to create these dynamic environments and the tools needed to evolve or be replaced with ones that could handle the dynamic requirements. So tell me a little bit more about how ThreadX is approaching this more dynamic and challenging environment. Many of our customers are large e-commerce sites, and they were kind of the first ones to help us really identify this as a problem. So about a year, a little over a year ago, our CTO started to look at the problem, look at the capabilities available in the open source world and, and started to evaluate it. And two years ago, we started a little bit down this journey. And he really started to understand what eBPF as a capability could allow us to do. Okay. Me as the CEO, you have to evaluate new projects as they come along because whether it's working at a company as large as IBM or as small as us, you always have limited resources. You have to decide. <laughs> so there have been a couple of projects that our CTO and our CTO's office group has brought to me and they're like, hey, let's go do this. And I'm like, no, we're not going to go bite that off. Okay. Uh, but when it came to really understanding the whole Docker environment, Kubernetes specific and everything that was going on, and then more succinctly down to how we could leverage eBPF to really innovate and offer our current capabilities and additional capabilities by being able to deploy at the container level was just eye-opening for us. Okay. So we just became really excited about it. We put a bunch of engineers on it. So yeah, it culminated in uh, what we've announced at the show today. Okay. So what did you announce at the show? <laughs> so, well, because cybersecurity, like all of IT needs another acronym, like it needs a hole in the head. Uh, we've come up with our own acronym. So we call it RAP. So it's Runtime API and Application Protection. Okay. And basically what we're able to do is take a um, container and attach as a sidecar via eBPF. And what that allows us to do is ultimately have a whole new level of visibility into what's going on in the container. Um, If we had a longer session, we could go into details of what agent versus what eBPF allows. But safe to say eBPF allows a ton of capabilities with literally near nil downside versus an agent. Okay. So basically by deploying at this level, we can see things like east-west traffic. We can see insider threat. We can see zero days, which are all cybersecurity issues that, that the cyber team is dealing with on a continuous basis. And as we talked about this dynamic environment, uh, we can ensure that as a server, or as a container gets spun up, that it's automatically attached to VEBPF to 
the ThreadX wrap sensor. So whether it's up for a second or whether it's up for a year, we're uh, enabling a protection for that. And I think underlying all of it is the ability to not only alert, which there's a lot of cybersecurity tools that do great alerting, right? Uh, but we can also block at this level, and that's okay. the innovation. That's the that's what we patented. Now, for those listeners who go, well, "I'd never want to block at that level," that's okay. <laughs> we can only alert as well. But for those that uh, are courageous and really want to, you know, defend their infrastructure. Uh, we can block at that level. So it's true protection. Typically, when you implement something that has the capability to block, like, say, a web application firewall, you run it in audit mode for a little <laughs> exactly. while. Get comfortable. <laughs> Make sure you have your rule sets down. And then you start blocking things and waiting for someone to scream. Yeah. So no, I totally get that. How would you position this versus a more traditional approach that is firewall-based or WAF-based? We have what we call our edge server, which are traditional application protection uh, via you know traditional WAF. So we have the reverse proxies. And we didn't think about this when we first uh, started to come up with this technology. But as we interviewed 35 CISOs, they all put it together that it's not either ors. Because we thought about it, hey, we've got our reverse proxy or our edge. And now we've got our RAP, our eBPF capabilities, and we thought it was either or, and they all put it together. But what we think about is there aren't many companies of standing that don't have some sort of application protection, but yet the application protection doesn't really allow the layer of protection that you need and the dynamic nature that we just talked about within this Kubernetes environment. So being able to really complement those things. So if a company has a traditional WAF, uh, they're still going to find a pretty big need for the wrap capabilities, but it's complementary to what they already own. Okay. One of the biggest challenges, at least when I've been setting up WAFs in the past, is building that initial rule set, mm-hmm. understanding the nature of yeah. your traffic. And the best products out there can do a baseline analysis for you yes. and make some suggestions. Yeah. They're not all going to be right, but yeah. that's okay. Is that something that the ThreadX solution does is sort of monitor and yeah. then make suggestions? I would say we take it a step further than that. It's kind of the secret sauce to the whole why we are what we are. And that is our engine, it's an ML engine uh, called HackerMind. And it allows us to be, um, what I would say, instead of having fine grain rules for every API or every application you're going to protect, our engine allows for a much more holistic view. Uh, not only of uh, the customer's environment, but versus all customers on our platform. Um, so the implementation as well as the management of whether the wrap sensor or the edge sensor, more similar to a WAF, what you're going to find is very low false positive, false negatives, and not a huge management burden through that. What level of fine-tuning in bacon is required to to implement that? Because I know, getting back to the WAF conversation, you know, you do it in audit mode for a while. There is some fine tune that happens. So it's not like an overnight thing. It's a project that you really have to manage and get into. But then at a certain point, it kind of runs itself. Is it a similar type of situation? We have a managed service offering for all of our uh, software. We don't sell anything uh, without it, but we don't charge anything extra for it. Mm -hmm. And we usually look at and say within the first 48 hours, we have enough baseline to work with our customers. Uh, They get enough information from HackerMind to be able to understand how it is. And within two weeks to three weeks, it's pretty stable. So it's not a heavy lift. It really isn't. We've been really blessed uh, by some large customers that start small because we're a relatively small company compared to it in Perva or some of the big companies out there. Uh, but when they see the, the, the low overhead of management and the stability of it, the low false positives, and the fact that it doesn't have that ongoing care and feeding, and we, we're going to build all those capabilities into the eBPF capabilities as well, uh, I think that's the ultimate value prop because it is difficult to deploy a WAF and think about having to tune these rules yourself and you're not necessarily an expert in this area. And even if you are, you might have an individual on your team that does that, but they could leave and go somewhere else. So so the value prop of ThreadX is ultimately solving that problem. That's why our founders started the company. Gotcha. Now, we are at KubeCon, yeah. but not everything runs in Kubernetes. Yeah. We know that. So 
to what degree can your solution help protect applications that are running outside of the cluster or components that are running outside the cluster? Our traditional edge platform, which is a reverse proxy, can protect just about anything, anywhere, uh, whether it be legacy or modern applications. We do have a whole nother level of visibility and an, uh, another level of capability, specifically in Kubernetes, which we'll eventually bring to other levels of Docker. Uh, so we'll, we'll be heterogeneous from that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but for things that are legacy, things that are not built on you know this modern architecture, uh, we can still absolutely protect it from the traditional uh, reverse proxy. Now, I always think of security as defense in depth, yeah. right? It's not just one solution. It's, it's a complementary set of solutions. Yeah. So what sort of adjacent solutions would you position with ThreadX to build out that defense in depth? Sure. Uh, for those that are familiar with these terms, um, uh, SIMs, so security information and event management, mm -hmm. um, log aggregators that are out there, um, whether you go from free versions all the way up to some very high-end new, uh, we typically see lots of log aggregation. We also see SOAR platforms, so security orchestration automation. Funny, I, I'll save it for another day, but I was a part of a company that was early days of that, but we didn't call it SOAR. But anyway, but the SOAR platforms are another way. Any ticketing systems. So ultimately what we're going to do, uh, if we're not able to block it, we'll sometimes create an alert. That alert has to go somewhere within a small, medium, large organization for somebody to, to answer it. So whether it's a ticking system, whether it's a SIM, whether it's integrated into a log system to create some sort of a rule set to optimize uh, back on the infrastructure, those are the typical things that we're surrounded by in our customer environment. Gotcha. So if folks are interested, they want to take it for a test drive or just learn more about the product, where's a good place for them to go? Easiest place to go is threadx.com. We have lots of tutorials, videos, they set up a demo. We're soon to have some downloadable capabilities. Not quite there yet, but uh, stay tuned and we'll have some downloadable capabilities for people to try it on their own. Gotcha. And I also hear that you have your own podcast, if you want to mention that as well. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate <laughs> it. So uh, it's called the Executive Security Podcast, uh, where we talk with CISOs uh, mostly about helping people understand why they would want a career in cybersecurity. So we've had uh, CISOs from companies like Lowe's, uh, Markel, T. Rowe Price, uh, and some smaller organizations. So we've done over 70 episodes um, so if you go to simply genefay.com, G-E-N-E-F-A-Y.com, uh, you can check out our episodes. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. To... <laughs> no, that sounds intriguing. I'm always interested in career advancement and helping the people in the community find their path. So that sounds like an interesting way to do that. Well, Gene Fay, thank you so much for being a guest today on Day 2 Cloud. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. You bet. That is going to do it for part one of the Security Cube Conversations from KubeCon 2023. If you like this format, please let us know. If you hated this format, please let us know. This was a fun experiment, and I'd love to get everyone's feedback. You can ping us on LinkedIn, fill out the contact form on day2cloud.io, or even join the Packet Pushers Slack at packetpushers.com slash Slack. Stay tuned for part two where we'll be talking to folks from Uptix, Sonotype, and Venify.